What's up, y'all? It's TTC, aka the Thunder Conductor, and we back for another YouTube video and Twitch stream. If you're on YouTube, make sure you know what to do. Like, subscribe, and ring the bell. We do this twice on YouTube, and if you're on Twitch, we do this once a week, but I still want you to follow and ring the bell. Come on now, let's all have a good time. I got a question for y'all real quick. What is your favorite Hermit Druid list in CEDH? If you're not familiar with Hermit Druid, it's a card that you use to mill yourself. And on the casual side, it's, you know, you can do play around with graveyard, recursion, and all the other fun things like that, as long as you don't run too many non basics. But in CDH, we're trying to empty that list and win the game. So I want to know, drop down. If you're on, if you're on Twitch, go and drop down and comment down real quick. What's your favorite Hermit Druid list? And if you're on YouTube, I want you to comment down. Let me know. I want you, I want to tell y'all my favorite Hermit Druid list, though. Because I brought my favorite Herman Jew, Herman Jewelist pilot onto the stream. And I'm going to let you know, it definitely has to be Alondo. Because he says Herman Jewelist still wins games. It's to the point that this brother, this brother has straight up gone from everything at 14th place in Lotus Con, 4th place at Food Fight 2, and 8th place at CDHT Party 2. Come on, like, that many places, this, this is by far the, my favorite list, but... I'm gonna stop talking it up. I'm gonna just bring the man, the myth, the legend on. Come on, real, come in the room, Martian. You here, brother? Hello, hello. What's up? How you feeling, man? I'm doing real good. Man, it's good to see you. It's good to be here. 100%. If y'all are not already aware, we brought him on before, but can you please just once again, give us an introduction. Tell us who you are, how you got into CDH, and how you got to Londo um my name on most most handles is martian centurion through discord and and most things it's the kid martian in in moxfield but it's the same person um i have been playing cedh for three years almost now i i didn't start with alando i i i started with i, th I want to say five color sisse at one point mm. um back back way before we had a lot of the the newer iterations that we see now 100 percent um but yeah i i started started with five pillars to say in cdh i've been playing magic since 2015 back in oath of the gatewatch uh, battle for zendikar type era okay um but yeah i got into cdh i i really loved alondo uh when he first came out and I made a casual deck, and it was way too good for casual. <laughs> but I had to, I had to do something fun with it. No, hundred percent. I feel you there. Dog. I feel you there. No, like big facts. So you've been doing this for a while. Like at this point, we could say if you're not a full fledged veteran, veteran, you're at least a, a moving into that veteranhood of your CDH experience. And so, with all that said, Alondo, you kind of said like it was the casual deck that just couldn't be casual. And so let's talk a little bit on that, like. What does Alondo do, and how does it keep it from being casual? Alondo is, if you don't know, a two generic and simic for a three five human shaman. Okay. Um, he is an activated ability of just tap. You don't have to pay mana. You don't have to have to do anything like that. He is summoning sick, which you know we'll address at some point. But um, basically, is one activated ability, and it says draw a card, then exile a card from your hand. You must mm. exile a card if you activate the ability. But mm. we want to be exiling these cards, so it's great. Right. Um, when you exile that card, put a number of time counters on it equal to its mana value. It gains when the last time counter is removed from this card. If it's exiled, you may cast it without paying its mana cost. If you mm. cast a creature spell this way, it gains haste until end of turn. Then you remove a time counter from each other card you own in exile. Hmm. I hear you there. So, okay, okay. It, it a, a lot of text, but you had a joke for us last time. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what do we read when we see this? What do we see? <laughs> uh, it it gives something not suspend. It's <laughs> it's based. It's it, if you pull up the 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 wiki page of the keyword suspend, it's every word of suspend without being suspend other than one to two minor details okay uh, that was it. <laughs> if it has suspend the time counters tick down in your upkeep these do not uh, these only tick down when you activate the commander okay. the second difference is the creatures only gain haste until end of turn suspend mm. as a mechanic just gives the creature haste so if you cast a creature on player three's turn 
uh, it'll go. It'll be that go back to being summoning sick on player four's turn. Understood. Understood. That makes sense. Like I'm glad you explained that because we one of my homies D Mage did just comment in the chat. I always trust that Alano pilots aren't cheating because I have not read them. <laughs> <laughs> like this is definitely a, a word text wall, but I feel like if you understand the generalness of suspended, understanding just that variation and how it interacts with haste and when it goes from crossing the turns and whatever not i feel like it gives you like a better understanding of this com what this commander is trying to do and so like from our last deck tech we talked about the no bad cards version of the list that was very powerful did di didn't get to do too much in our last stream however th apparently you told me that this one is not even the most powerful version you corrected me apparently the most <laughs> powerful version is this hermit jewel list and yeah. so I want to go in deep dive and just fully just break everything down. But before we do that, I have to say, if you're looking for more ways to support the show, we have a lot of ways starting off with our new, but amazing TC Thunder Conductor merch. Check out our uh, check out link in the bio. We got everything from the TC Classic to the TC Blackout and TC Whiteout logo design. If you're looking for uh, to have some new swag for the MTG community, come on, just check us out. We also have our Thunder Conductor proxies. This is my way to increase access to the amazing format we call CDH. Not to mention. If you're saying, I don't really want to buy no products, but I would love to join the community. We have an open Discord. Come check us out. Bruce, jam some games, ask some questions. We all about learning and being better. But if you want deeper access to be able to get shout outs on the stream, ask me exclusive questions and get your own deck reviewed right here on the channel, go ahead and join the Thunder Con Conductor community Patreon. And very last, you're saying, T, I love everything you got to offer. But I'm be honest. I just want to bless you one time for the fun time don't worry i got you go ahead and just buy me a coffee it keeps the lights on it keeps me up but with that said go ahead martian get get straight into it talk to me brother what is different like just tell us how we win and i'm pretty sure we've already said that we got the hermit win the title but talk to me brother mm -hmm. um this this version of the list i actually did i think i hopefully did a pretty good job of doing the different tags okay uh, and hopefully that will uh you know kind of kind of guide us through okay um, a lot of what this what this deck can do okay um if you hit the tags yep, we've got we got one hermit druid package yep we got the hermit druid okay talk um, to us so exiling hermit druid to alondo and casting it through his ability gives it haste which is the number one downside of most hermit druid decks oh. um casting hermit druid having it be summoning six uh, just like sets off alarm flares to everybody um and you get stopped it, it dies to literally anything um but because we get to cast hermit druid with flash and with haste um mm. not only can we can we main phase a hermit druid we can actually win with hermit druid at instant speed got you got you got you okay I actually love the way <laughs> I didn't think about that. The fact that you've basically bypassed the main weakness of Hermitjua because no one's going to react to, oh, he's casting his commander. That's what we do in commander. You know, whether you in CDH or EDH, you know, he's like, now it's kind of like, oh, shit, he's casting his commander. It has no more summoning sickness. Is he going to flash in a Hermitjua and we can't do nothing about it, which is extremely scary. Okay, so. We flash in the Hermit Druid, and I'm seeing some other cards like a Deep Analysis and Fate Stitcher and Memories Journey. Like, what what are these doing for this package? Um, basically, what Memories Journey does is it basically gives you sort of a Doomsday pile. Mm, um, got you, got you, got you. It's it's a, it's a three card Doomsday pile. So after you activate Hermit Druid, you reveal that you have no basic lands in your entire library. <laughs> right. <laughs> you have no library. Um, except you have these spells with flashback, or in this case, or with Fate Stitcher, Unearth. Okay. Um, so for one green mana, you activate the Hermit Druid. For a second green mana, you cast Memory's Journey from, from with its flashback cost. Uh, targeting yourself, shuffling, um, depending on whether you're trying to win at instant speed or on your main phase, kind of changes what kind of quote unquote doomsday pile you're going for. Mm, okay. Um, okay. Under the assumption, that you're winning on main phase of your turn. Um, one of the reasons that we are on Hermit Druid is because it removes the pressure of Alondo being not only your card advantage and, and your general mana advantage sort of too, 
Um, with the no bad cards list, it tends to also be your outlet, which puts mm. a lot more strain on having a Londo already be in play and activating and, and having those gears turning already. Um, Hermit Druid can win all by itself. So you only need Hermit Druid in play to win the game. Okay, understood. Which is understood. one of the reasons that, that her, the, this deck, I think, is better than the the no, the no bad cards at this point, point in time until we get, you know, new cards and better cards, all that kind of stuff. 100%, 100%. Um, okay. But yeah, Hermit Druid assembles the whole combo by itself. So the combo is, uh, if Hermit Druid is in play and not summoning sick, okay. on your upkeep, you activate Hermit Druid, milling your library, and then casting Memory's Journey. 100%. So we're at if two green mana. It, we're at two green mana so far to do the combo thus far. Okay, keep going. Yeah, in in your upkeep, you cast the memory journey. In this case, only targeting Thassa's Oracle, uh, mm. because memory journey is up to three cards, not exactly three cards. Okay, that makes uh, sense. That makes sense. In which case, you draw the Thassa's Oracle as your draw for turn. You just cast the Thassa's Oracle, and you have no library. So that that alone wins the. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Nice, clean, simple, gets the job clean. Okay. Do we have any other, like, I'm seeing a deep analysis as well. Like, is there any other variations to this where you may want to use the deep analysis or fate stitcher? Um, there are. So deep okay. analysis is there for more protected wins, assuming you have access to more mana and it's later in the game. Mm. Um, because memory's journey lets you shovel three cards you can actually make a three card doomsday pile rather than just Thassa's Oracle. Um, uh, basically what you do is you get Thassa's Oracle, Pact of Negation or, and some other counter spell or, or an endurance or something like that, depending okay. on how much mana you have and cards in hand and stuff like that. Um, so basically what deep analysis lets you do is you draw a card for turn, flashback the deep analysis to draw your additional two cards for protection. Okay. Um, and that lets you protect the Thassa's Oracle win. Um, with Pact of Negation or, or a free counter spell or an endurance to reset just in case you're worried about somebody endure or uh, somebody else uh, exiling your graveyard or or doing some kind of shenanigans to stop you. Got you, uh, got you. Understood, understood. That makes sense. That makes sense. We have a question from D Mage. He says the Fate Stitcher is for Alondo question mark. Fate Stitcher is there to sometimes convert a blue mana for the unearth ability into two blue mana to cast the Thassa's Oracle, or it, it, it's mostly there for the mana fixing in this instance. Um, okay. We have a number of different ways to tap for multiple different colors of mana, depending on your ma on the, the mana base you have in play or dorks or vice versa. It, it's basically there to convert uh, different colors of mana into, into what you actually need to win the game. Mm, understood, this makes sense, okay. And when I'm guessing, so Fate Stitcher alongside another mana dork, or is, is uh, what which mana dorks are we usually looking to target Fate Stitcher with Fate Stitcher's ability? With Fate Stitcher's ability, uh, if you have, um, usually it's in instances with Utopia Sprawl. Um, ah, gotcha, Utopia gotcha. Sprawl. You almost always name blue with Utopia Sprawl on a uh, tropical island or hedge maze which we'll get to in a minute, or okay. Brooding Pool, to where you can tap, use the Fate Stitcher Convert one blue mana into double blue mana. Understood. Um, that that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. He, he, he in the shop. He in the shop. Okay. So we, we've we seen now you can win by its, with Herman Jewel by itself. We can win with memory using Memories Journey. We can also use Deep Analysis to add protection. And we can also use Fate Stitcher to, if I remember correctly, to color fix ourselves to get that double blue for the Thassa's Oracle or whatever not. So are there any other lines that we're using the amazing Hermit Jewel to win? Um, that's the primary one. Um, we can also Court of Calling it directly into play on somebody else's end step uh, if we don't have our Alondo in play. Um, we can also just hard cast a board upon a wind, which can is part of the the instant speed um, doomsday type pile with memory's journey. Okay. Um, we can just cast a board upon a wind and then just cast the hermit druid on somebody's end step if we have both in hand. Right, right, right. Definitely hear that. And my guy, I love born upon the wind. I was never fully slept on this card, <laughs> but dog, I ain't gonna cap. This card is just disgusting. Like. 
it went like I literally had the other day where I flashed in a what is that? It uh not a deafening silence. What is that white enchantment that costs two mana and it makes artifacts of it and enchantments into the battlefield ta uh, tapped? Artifacts and creatures. Like blind obedience. Blind obedience. It was the epitome of we were about to go into a Thrasios Dargo turn. And I was like, let me just flash in this bind obedience. Because it was about 25 <laughs> artifacts and enchantments on this board. We not about to do that. It's like the epitome of like, I'm going to put this in to stop people. But it, like uh, most times, of course, we're using it to win at instant speed. But it's just crazy what this card can do. And so even with the quarter calling, you being able to flash in the card as well. Such an amazing like, you no know, possibilities with this, uh, with the... um with the hermit druid okay so okay so we've we've broken down the hermit druid are there any other notable hermit druid lines you'd like to touch on um not hermit druid line specifically um i would like to point out that it probably should be in both the hermit druid package and the unc dispatches package uh mm. malevolent hermit um malevolent hermit on the back side um because it's a creature spell it is a lot more difficult to interact with it can it can sort of be a pseudo grand abolisher um letting us protect our memories journey um which is one of the ways that people can stop us um Got you know you. counterspelling our memories journey in our upkeep mm, understood and is this so this is something you bring back with this is you set this up on the turn before how how do you usually set up this uh the malevolent uh the benevolent uh geist you know side of um, the non-creature spells can't you control can't be countered yeah it like i said it kind of depends on how much mana you have in your board state mm. um if you have a londo in play or in this case the deep analysis um basically what you do is you you don't activate hermit druid in your upkeep you activate it on your main phase um so mm. activate the hermit druid on your main phase mill the library then you cast the backside of malevolent hermit the build of benevolent geist mm. this will protect your memory's journey cast the memory's journey um putting Thoracal and, you know, Pact of Negation back in. Then you cast your Deep Analysis to draw both of those cards, and now you have a, an extra protected Thassus Oracle in that way. Ah, uh, I got you. So then at that point, counter magic isn't the problem. You just got to worry about your devotion, making sure you have those blue pips to win in the case they can remove your Thassus Oracle or an Endurance win or whatever or not. But you have the Pact of Negation to stop the Endurance or any other effects they may do to, re to remove the Thassus. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right, all right. Okay, now we talked about Hermit Druid. I'm seeing we have a second package here with Unctus. Now, mm -hmm. talk to me about this creature because this is not one we get to see in CDH that often. Mm -hmm. Unctus is basically a way to sculpt your exact cards in hand most mm -hmm. of the time. Okay. If you have Unctus in play, Unctus allows you to draw a card and then discard a card whenever a blue creature you control becomes tapped um, oh <laughs> basically our commander okay understood, understood. our commander is a blue creature we we will draw and discard every time we activate a londo um, which you know can help us discard fetch lands that we can't use anymore or just cards we don't need um so it is just good just for pure value on the on the front side but it can also be a combo piece because we have both a Fedo alchemist and Seeker of Skybreak, which allow themselves to untap themselves. Um, they don't say another target creature, they just say untap target creature. Gotcha, uh, gotcha. So, a Fennel Alchemist, already a blue creature, and already able to untap itself. Um, Seeker of Skybreak is a green creature, but Unctus has a Phyrexian mana ability, converting that creature into a blue artifact creature. Uh, letting you combo off and draw and discard through your entire library um, over and over again. Wait, hold on. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> this, okay, so if you all haven't had the opportunity to fully read what Unk is there, this is saying pay two, I mean, pay two life until end of turn. Target creature you control becomes a blue artifact in addition to its other colors and types. Activate only a sorcery. Okay, so it's not an instant speed win, but what this man Martian has just told us is that by targeting either your Seeker of Skybreak or your Alfetto Alchemist that says untap target artifact or creature, they can untap themselves, but, be, but whenever they tap, you draw and discard a card, basically sculpting the perfect hand. Get out of here. Mm -hmm. What the fuck? That's fucking crazy. 
Oh my gosh, man. Keep going, keep going. You you ordered something here, okay? You ordered something here, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the cards that are good with Hermit Druid are also good with Unctus. Um, Benevolent Geist being able to come back from the graveyard, Fate Sitcher coming back from the graveyard. Deep yeah. Analysis in particular has been especially good yeah. with Unctus lines. Um, on the off chance you only have exactly one card in hand, um, this only having one card in hand basically forces you to only get Thassa's Oracle to try and win the game. Mm. Uh, because we have deep analysis that we can cast from the graveyard, going up to three, again, lets us get Pact of Negation and some other kind of protection in order to, to actually go up to three cards and sculpt the perfect three card hand instead of just one. Mm. Okay, okay. All right, all right. Keep going, keep going. Uh, Memory's Journey has also been very good for these kinds of lines uh, because you can actually be sneaky in the off chance that Thassa's Oracle, um, for whatever reason, doesn't win you the game because of some kind of torpor orb effect or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, Memory's Journey, obviously having a, a substantial amount of mana, um, lets you get creative with the card, your your exact cards in hand, in order to uh, create an infinite win condition in a different kind of way. Okay. without fast oracle um, okay. because you're drawing um drawing and discarding sometimes you have to convolute some weird ways to make enough mana and um usually involving free from real or pemens order in order to you know, actually go infinite on mana okay um sometimes what you do is you end up drawing and discarding um, cards you don't want to or cards you wish had been lower in the library or cards you wish had, you had seen later mm. um, usually with like crop rotation for a Gaia's Cradle if you accidentally draw Gaia's Cradle um, before you draw the crop rotation it can kind of sometimes hinder you on mana understood understood um, so being able to memories journey the Gaia's Cradle onto the bottom of your library or anywhere in your library, once you have crop rotation in hand, you can then crop rotation into a Gaia's Cradle or a Nykthos to make the kinds of mana you need to, to navigate your way into an actual winning line. Understood, understood, okay. All right, so yeah. I understand. So that that one's kind sense. of harder to, harder to explain just because it, it kind of varies on what kinds of things you need. Um, but okay. when you play it out, you'll f that's the kinds of situations you will find yourselves in. Okay. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong here. So then basically what you're saying here is in those events where Thassa's Oracle is not an option, we we will end up using one of our alternate win cons to win, but we'll still be able to use the same packages that Hermit Druid and Unctus allows us to do to draw Thor th through our library with um, our commander and other effects. And we're leveraging memory, Memory's Journey to kind of navigate and mold the deck to our liking. Is that kind of mm -hmm. how I'm hearing it? exactly okay understood okay well with that said before before we move on to other wing cons is there any other aspects to the hermit druid or the unctus lines that you want to touch on um i think that's most of it like i said the fate stitcher again there to kind of sculpt your mana as a as a one mana way to come back in and uh untap mana sources as needed understood um, yeah you know it, it during the the food fight two tournament um I actually ended up winning the game. Um, I, somebody else had tried to go off, and I had a Ristic study in play for a really long time, and I had a whole bunch of cards in hand. Yeah. Um, I had four lands and basically no other permanents in play. Um, but because of Fate Stitcher and Unctus, I was able to um, weave my way into into a winning winning line with only four mana <laughs> and a whole bunch of cards in play, and the ability to draw and discard Fate Stitcher. Um, having haste with an earth was exactly enough to win me that game. <laughs> oh man, I love to see that face stitch is still CDH viable because this is definitely a card like when you're looking up more fringe uh, combos that you know, like oh this con this card comes with this. You need just face stitcher and twenty other cards. But when you have such a potent draw engine in the command zone, it makes face stitcher move from this fringe zone to like no, this is an essential combo piece that we can very easily just cycle from our hand to our graveyard using cards like Unctus to really get it going. 
Mm-hmm. Um, we actually have a question from some from D Major. He is, how realistic is it to a simple unctus plus untapper? Alondo gives you untapper's haste, but it still makes it takes a lot of st- setup to utilize Alondo multiple times a turn. Talk to me about that. Um, one of the ways that we we do this is we we sometimes have storm like turns okay. um where because alando gives the untappers haste um the untappers you know untap alando we activate alando we cast another untapper that untapper t- untaps alando we activate alando again and and we kind of chain the untappers together because we play so many of them mm, um, got you got you got you and another thing to point out, it's not just a combo with a Fedo Alchemist and Seeker of Skybreak. You can actually do the same Unctus combo with any of your other creatures that say untap another target permanent. Mm. Um, so you can combo Fate Stitcher and Kiora's Follower or um, and, and literally any of your other untappers. Um, you got know, you. Earth of the Healing House plus Vizier of Tumbling Sands. Each one untapping the other and just going back and forth, chaining those together. Ah, and so in order because because the combo may take multiple pieces to like get to that finished state of we win the game, we have run a high density along, mm-hmm. of course, with card drawn tutors, where we just run such a high density of these untapped effects. It basically allows us to almost stumble into it off natural just drawing and just by just being us, we'll naturally get into it if that's how we're receiving it right. Yeah, we, we, we get there very naturally. Another thing to point out is Freed from the Real and Pemanzora both, which we'll talk about later because they're combos by themselves. Um, either of those two permanents enchanted onto anything that either taps for blue mana or untaps a thing that taps for blue um, also can do function the same way. So a Freed from the Real enchanted to a Kiora's Follower lets you still tap a blue creature an infinite number of times, um, because you can untap a blue source, uh, a blue tapping land, use that blue land and free from the real to untap the Kyrus follower and, mm. and and continue looping through that way. So it's it's a lot more than just a Fedo Alchemist and Seeker of Skybreak. Basically, all of these do do that and, and fill that same role. Understood. Understood. OK, well, she's we're already talking about it. We've talked about the Hermit. We've talked about the Unctus let's just talk about these other win cons you got like is is that kind of going to number three with the illusionist bracers package is that another win con that is another win con okay um, let's talk basically you can all of the combos that basically work with unctus almost all convert into illusionist bracers wins as well um, <laughs> okay. both the fellow alchemist and seeker of skybreak have the ability to untap themselves when equipped with Illusionist Bracers, let you not only untap themselves, but untap another artifact or creature. Oh. Um, most of the time being your commander, but doing this, you can also net infinite mana that way. Um, okay. You know, untapping uh, a mana dork or a, a land or an artifact um, lets you get infinite mana because you can untap the thing and itself and keep going that way. Okay, 100%. And for our audience, for those who are not familiar with this card, this is not a very common card you see in CDH, but it's very potent with this deck. It, Illusionist Brazers is a two mana artifact equipment within a three equipped, it costs three to equip, and it says whenever an ability of equipped creature is activated, is activated, if it isn't a mana ability, copy that ability, you may choose new targets for the copy. So you get two untaps for one tap. Okay. Yep. All right. Two, two untaps for one tap. Um, again, if you have two of your untap another target permanent, um, they can untap each other and, and net infinite that way. Um, mm, I hear you. Illusionist Bracers also kind of works with a Londo by itself. Um, every time you activate a Londo, just naturally for value, you'll get two activations of a Londo, which is great. Mm, and every resolution of a Londo, we're taking off one of the counters off the creatures that we uh, may have suspended, quote unquote. And so basically we're just shredding through these high um these high suspend like fake suspend counters and la- mm-hmm. allowing us to storm off or combo off even more faster if that's what i'm hearing yeah it it, it turns a lot any an alondo activation just double it 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 <laughs> it it works really really well um, so if you have illusionist bracers alondo plus any of your untapper you end up with four activations of alondo rather than two if you didn't have the illusionist bracers okay all right so, okay 
that makes sense. Any other uh, intrinsic or little tricks of the trade that we the audience should know about this illusion this bracers package? Um, not specifically. Like I said, it's mostly there for to go infinite through Alondo activations. Most of the time, again, you can you can always net infinite mana most of the time. Um, you can also do some really fun things with the one ring that can also be your outlet um, for this kind of combo. I love um, one ring. <laughs> that's the best draw <laughs> engine in CD. I don't give a fuck what nobody say. That's the best draw engine in this game. I don't. Y'all can at me. I don't care, bro. That's the best draw engine, man. Talk to me, bro. I I can't remember a game where the one ring has resolved and I lost the game. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you got so many untappers, bro. It's like yeah. you got Seaborn using steroids in this deck, man. Yes. Like I said, oh, we, we abuse the one ring more than almost any other deck in the format, and we abuse Seaborn Muse more than any other deck in the format. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, man. Okay. So uh, talk to us. How, does, how, how do you usually use the one ring in the Illusionist Bracers combo? Um... Most of the time, it involves not Seeker of Skybreak in this specific instance. Okay. Um, it can if you have something else that says untap target, another target permanent. Mm. Obviously, that can untap the one ring. Got you. And, and you kind of assemble it that way. Um, most of the time, it ends up being uh, activate the one ring, draw a bunch of cards, um, activate the creature that's equipped with Illusionist Bracers, untap the one ring and itself. Um, in the case of a Fetal Alchemist, and you can just keep going that way because a Fetal Alchemist can untap target artifact. Hmm. Hear you. I hear that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But Alondo's not the only outlet uh, in in the in the deck. We've got 100%. the One Ring and Alchemist as the as the primary. Gotcha. Yeah. I talk about it all the time with my audience of the importance of being able to win without your commander. It's okay if okay, it's it's the outlet after I make infinite mana, but even then, can you win if you don't have access to the, the commander? When we have things like Dranith the Magistrate is such a big thing. You have Cursed Totem where you may not be able to immediately activate our commander, but there's other ways to get around these type of effects that may stop our commander centric plan. And so yeah, it, it is D Mage. Yeah, this deck is sick, no cap. So like let's keep it going. We talked briefly about free free from the real and Pimmons aura. Let's keep let's get a little deeper. We got the package for Freed for the Real and Pemmin's Aura. Freed from the Real and Pemmin's Aura. When you enchant them to a creature that says untap another target permanent. Um, if you have any permanent that taps for more than one blue mana, um, they allow you to generate an infinite number of untaps. Um, most of the time, this is usually through Utopia Sprawl, but we also have a Nykthos. Um, Shrine to Nyx, which okay. taps for your devotion to blue. Um, and basically, as long as you have both of these enchantments and un enchant to an untapper that makes at least two devotion, um, the third devotion is to Rolando, and you almost always have some other permanent in play that is for has a blue pip in the in the on the field. Right. Um, Malevolent Hermit, you know. Mystic Study, Mystic Grimora, whatever. Gotcha. Um, so as long as your devotion is four or more, um, Nykthos generates an infinite amount of blue mana. Hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Please, <laughs> once again, a card that people have been slept on. We ain't touched this land in so long, but I like to hear it, okay? And of course, we run crop rotation to ensure that we can get to this land if it's not already on the battlefield. Yeah. Both Crop Rotation and Archdruid's Charm both allow you to put the land directly into play. Um, yes. And because even though Archdruid's Charm puts the land into play tapped, we untap stuff. That's the whole deck. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Makes sense. Okay. And we, we talked briefly about it, but this Utopia Sprawl is in this package as well. Could we re-talk on like, how this interacts with our Free from the Real and also our Pimizora? Mm -hmm. So Utopia Sprawl, when enchanted to a breeding pool, tropical island, or hedge maze. Um, when you name blue off of Utopia Sprawl, it allows that land to tap for two blue. Um, because Freed and Real allows you to untap for only one blue, you can keep activating Pemanzora and net you infinite blue mana that way. Mm, got you, got you. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And then once we make these infinite mana, we have the infinite untaps. We draw our deck with our commander. We win the game. <laughs> yep. Add uh, instant speed at oh, and at instant speed at that and if you're if you are all aren't aware we are um 
touching on Alondo, the beautiful thing about Alondo is you can basically your cat. You're not you're getting around the cash trigger because one. Well, if I remember, like once you get the you draw your deck, you get the Thassa's Oracle into your hand, and you're able to put it down and have the ETB go off and empty your library all the way to however much you want, however devotion you have. And I'm guessing that's how you finish off the combo once you're finished. Um, Thassa's Oracle is is the the cleanest and simplest way for sure. We have three others um that we can go for um two of which are instant speed um the other two you involve combat with finale of devastation and ah. destiny uh, yeah but yeah we we usually just go for Thassa's oracle just because it's the the easiest to explain to our opponents <laughs> <laughs> they said well how do you beat this when you draw a deck just just Thassa's oracle well i'll do this and okay then i'll for now we i have a, ter- a 13 step plan i'll tell you exactly how it happens <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah. from the real and Pemenzor also tend to be your most resilient to interaction combos um because as long as we have another thing that taps for blue we can just win again on top of whatever they're trying to use whatever removal spell they're trying to use on our creature um so once these enchantments have resolved it's really hard to stop us ah uh, and tell us again so why why what makes the root the enchantment resolving be the tough part about interacting why can't you know usually cdh players like to wait to the last minute to interact so as a cdh pilot what would hurt me after letting this resolve once this is resolved um the first activation of course is you know tapping your permanent for blue mana got you Um, and then most of the time once they realize that it's an infinite mana loop they'll uh try and interact with the untap of the creature on the stack but that's too late because we have more blue mana to just untap the thing again and then activate it again on top of whatever removal spell they're trying to use So if if they okay my the, un, the activate fruit from real untap enchanted creature in response to that I'm gonna swords it all right I'm gonna pay a blue and untap it again and activate it again and 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 then you can win again over top of it Anyways. right 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 hundred percent it's very it sounds very similar to how like you know you have to do that extra math with Kenan like they'll cast the basalt and people will think well I'll just wait till basalt resolves and then everybody does the math oh no dude Kenan has. 12 mana available to them like if that basalt resolves we don't have enough removal or interaction to uh ki- like to remove the cannon or the basalt before they can put so many untaps on the stack that's what i'm mm-hmm. it's very much reminding me of that yeah and and that's part of what makes the um untap another target permanent creatures so helpful in this is because all, almost all of these win conditions except for hermit druid um let you win again on top of whatever removal they're trying to use Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I feel that. Okay. And resilience is important, and also what's important is just being able to know that, knowing how to interact, but also just knowing, like, bro, the minute I hear pass, like you can leave that, but you can have that breath of sigh of relief, be like, ah, I just won the game. Mm-hmm. Y'all can't do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. That that video of like, y'all y'all pass, y'all pass, but all right. I will proceed yeah. to it like it at that point it's just over i love that man so we have a lot of like once again great untapping effects we're using this nick through trying to nix and utopia sprawl uh along with freed from the real and pinman's aura to just make infinite mana draw our deck out and use things like finale of devastation and thassa's oracle to win the game so then let's go talk about this intruder of the alarm package i'm seeing forbidden orchard and i'm very interested to see how this works talk to me yeah uh- before we do that, one quick point. Okay. Um, when you're doing the Freed from the Real and Pemmons or our combos, don't point it out to your opponents. <laughs> <laughs> Let them figure it out on their own. Because um, most of the time you'll get through, you know, one or two iterations of the loop before they realize, oh, wait, this this does the thing. Uh, <laughs> and by then you've got like five, ten blue mana and there's no way they can stop you at that point. Ah, uh, so it's, it's like, don't let a resolve and say, okay, y'all scoop. Don't be like, all right. I'm going to tap it and I'm going to untap this. Is that okay? Be like, yeah, go ahead. All right, I'm going to tap it and I'm going to untap it. Is that okay? And by the time, like, you'll, you'll do it for the third or fourth or fifth iteration, they're like, hold on, is this infinite? And you'd be like, it, it is whatever you want it to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and then at that let, point. Let your opponent's display. That's that's the easiest way to win CEDH games. <laughs> you said what? 
and say, let your opponents misplay. It's no, the easiest please, way to win. Especially with the uh, with the decks that are just not part of the top ten meta, the Sisays, the TNKs, the Kennens. Not everybody knows what your deck doing, so go ahead and use that Brewer's advantage to your advantage. You know, especially in the in these TDH environments where everyone just kind of know thinks they just mastered CDH to the highest level. Like, okay, you're the best player in the world. Great. All right, great, great, great. Do I can I untap it? Okay, cool, cool, cool. I'm gonna tap it again. Can I untap it? Okay, cool, cool, cool. No, I love that, brother. I love that. Okay, so. Politics, guys. Learn how to politic. Learn how to navigate the table. There's a there's a social and a mental game you gotta play. All right. Yeah. That's it. Learn learn how to politics and let your let your untappers let them think they're just untappers. Let them think they're just there to untap a Londo. <laughs> mm, I hear you. I hear you. Oh yeah. I like that. I like that. Yeah, that, that reminds me a lot of. Uh, I haven't got to play her in a while, but my Rionia Fire Dancer like. Everyone knows that she's a combo piece, but it's this thing of like, I I love the <laughs> whenever I cast a combat celebrant or a bloodthirster, and people are like, this is game, right? And I just sit there like, I'm just sitting there just like quiet. Everybody like, yeah, this is game, right? They just doing the math. Nah, this ain't the win. And everybody's like, nah, I think it's the win. It's like, but nah, I'd be like, but he can only attack. He can't attack the same person. And just the same conversation every time. And then I finally present the loot. There's like oh yeah we were fucked we should have interacted two iterations ago i'm like yeah you should have interacted <laughs> two iterations ago. <laughs> i love that brother okay all right cool is there anything else you want to talk about this free from real free from the real and pinman's aura package uh don't be afraid to just enchant alondo with either of them paying mm. one blue to activate your commander again is a pretty good rate <laughs> mm. pay, pay five blue mana activate alondo five times that's that's solid. That'll win you a lot of games. I hear that. I definitely hear that. Uh, so that, you, that go ahead, brother. Yeah, go ahead. Is it, you, you have so many other ways to win the game that just casting your Freed from the Rails and Penanzora just for value, just do it. It's great. It's fine. You'll mm. be fine. <laughs> yeah. That reminds me of a, an advice somebody gave me in my last tournament was they was like, I was first time I was playing with uh, what's the instant speed win spell born upon the wind and i was like man this card was just sitting in my hand i didn't know what to do with it there's like bro it's still a cantrip you don't have to use it wait to win with it like if you need to go one card deeper it's okay they're like oh yeah it is just a two mana cantrip and yeah at that point it's a terrible cantrip but sometimes these combo pieces like it's like using the tainted pact as a tutor to find like oh i need to untap well, one more mana to be able to do x y and z it's okay to use a tainted pact to dig a couple cards deep yeah okay i'll exile a chrome mox and or whatever not but i need to make sure i find a two mana source like a mana crypt or whatever other bs you need to just net one extra mana you know what i'm saying how that was a terrible example but whatever you need to do don't be afraid to be creative with your cards that's what i just basically heard so i love that yeah and and Unctus and Illusionist Bracers and Freed and Pemanzora and Intruder Alarm, we're going to talk about next. All of these are also there to just generate pure value. Mm. Um, they said, don't, don't be afraid. Don't sit, let them just sit and rot in your hand. Um, Unctus in play still lets any of your untappers draw and discard every time they activate. Or if you want to activate Unctus, they let your mana dorks draw and discard every time they tap for mana. Um, 100%. Yeah, so just 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 fire him off. You'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like to hear that. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so intruder we got, alarm time. Yes, intruder alarm. I, I see this for Ben Orchard. I'm very interested. Talk to us. So intruder alarm, uh, pretty classic combo card. Two and a blue for an enchantment. Creatures don't untap during the controller's untap. Mm. Step. Next clause: Whenever a creature enters the battlefield, untap all creatures. This will include your opponents, but we don't care because we're going to win over top of them anyway. <laughs> mm, talk to me. So basically, Intruder Alarm plus Shrieking Drake, uh, as long as you have any creature that taps for blue or a creature that untaps a thing that taps for blue, lets you cast Shrieking Drake over and over again, trigger your Intruder Alarm over and over again. Mm. Um, and Shrieking Drake is if you don't know, is a one mana, one one with flying, and when it comes into play, return a creature you control to its owner's hand. And Understood. with this combo, you're going to return the Shrieking Drake over and over again to your hand. Mm, got you, got you, got you. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. So every time the whenever un untap all creatures trigger resolves from Intruder Alarm, um, the Shrieking Drake entering is going to not only untap your Alanto, but also your untap your your creature you use to cast the. The shrieking drake so it lets you net infinite amount of londo activations 
Understood. That makes sense. Okay. Cool. 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 Mm-hmm. All right. And then with that, I'm guessing where the Forbidden Orchard comes in is that every time the Forbidden Orchard is, orchard is tapped, it can trigger the retreat intruder alarm because it doesn't matter where the creature comes from, it untaps everything with the Forbidden mm-hmm. Orchard, if I'm correct. Yes. So, okay. uh, you, as long as you have any creature that untaps of another tar- target permanent, we can keep giving our opponents 1 1 spirits and keep intru- triggering the intruder alarm. Okay. Sounds good. Yep. Pretty A plus B. Makes sense. Making sense. Okay. Is a there any B. intricacies or anything that we need to think about when we think about this intruder alarm package? Intruder alarm is really good against Najila. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> Najila's going to go to make five warriors. We're going to get five intruder alarm triggers and we're going to activate our commander five times, assuming <laughs> we don't have any other untappers. If we have any other untappers, five becomes 10 or 10 becomes 15, and then we just win. Oh my gosh, not the is good against the meta. Fuck. <laughs> oh man, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see a Najila popping off a force of will or a force of negation, not giving a fuck if they're knowledgeable. I can definitely hear you there, bro. Okay, that makes 100% sense. Okay. <laughs> it also shows other people's forbidden orchards, <laughs> oh. which is good to know. You can I... respond to whenever some the, so the forbidden orchard tra- is a trigger. Uh, flashing, casting the intruder alarm off of your commander's abilities, uh, letting that 1 1 spirit enter off of somebody else's forbidden orchard also does the same thing. <laughs> and if I could say this, I want to go off on a little tangent for a second. These forbidden orchards, I'm going to be honest, I just, I'm not a huge fan of it. Like, like I know this is a very niche situation, but I just cannot see a universe where, and I know it's just a 1-1 spirit, but nowadays it feels like every deck can use that 1-1 token spirit for something to benefit it. You know what I'm saying? Even if it's a blocker to keep them alive a little bit longer, like, like in your opinion, like how do you feel about forbidden orchard in the current CDH meta? I think too many decks play it. I think there's enough five color lands that a lot of the decks that are on it don't need it. Hmm. I agree. Uh, I people, believe even people. like I believe another one that we really don't see too often is if I can remember, it's the land that taps were colorless and then once and you can also pay three life and tap it. What is that uh, land? Uh, Tarnished Citadel. Tarnished Citadel. Thank you. It's a land that I know a lot of people run from because this is like, oh my gosh, like three life each color. It's like each time you tap of a color, I'm like, yes, that's true. It, it's true. But if you're not on that nauseum or necro or some other life gaining, if like life loss and effect, I'm gonna be honest, you you're gonna end the game on 20 plus life, maybe in the teens, it may even single digit. But then the argument comes up, well, as long as you win the game, I don't care if you win a one life. Like I've won games in one or two life, and I'll, I'll be like, dang man, I almost died. Like. You almost died. You're still alive. You're fine, bro. I have mm-hmm. to keep saying that to myself. So it's always tough to like put those types of lands in. But when right now where a token can be such a benefit, a creature is such a benefit. These things are just it's so hard to just give people that type of benefit in this type of meta we're in right now yeah. where everyone's using the token. It's like it's hard nowadays, man. So another one is Spire of Industry. People don't play Spire of Industry nearly enough. Spire Everybody's got so artifacts. Good. Spire it's, of Industry is so good. Especially like in CDH, everyone's running mana crypts. Everyone's running all the basic rocks. If unless you're in a in like a five color stacks deck, which is not too often, unless I mean maybe if you're running a five color Kenrith deck, where you're mm-hmm. trying to turn off artifacts. I'm a, but I know you're not doing that in Kenrith either way because you want Dockside. Like mm-hmm. it's it, it's just at this point like you're you're gonna get an artifact eventually. You know, yes, it sucks if it's the only land in your hand. It's okay. Just aggressively mulligan you'll, you'll be fine i've yeah, i there's fine. very seldom times where that spire of industry is not turned on for me so i definitely mm-hmm. i agree with you there brother no cap yeah, man. yeah. okay mm-hmm. anything else for this intruder alarm package not really um like i said don't don't be afraid to just fire it off for value we run i think it's 26 creatures right now um we we can kind of just storm off with it and and get there naturally even if you don't already have the combo assembled um, okay. You know, if you have Alondo plus two creatures that untap Alondo, you're probably going to find a creature within the first three activations of Alondo to just hit another creature and keep going that way. Um, I definitely hear that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, with that said, we have I've we've just touched on five very potent and powerful combos. Are there any other win cons or combos you want to touch on? Um. 
I would probably like to touch on the intuition package if, for the deck. Oh, 100%, please. Um, so intuition, you know, is a pretty staple card in most of your Underworld Breach type decks. Um, we get a little more creative in this deck with an intuition. Mm -hmm. um, not only can you intuition for value and, and we can talk about that here in a second, but the, the intuition package in this deck, um, Agatha Soul Cauldron, Noxious Revival, and Hermit Druid. So Any one of the three okay. cards guarantees you either have a Hermit Druid in your hand that you can cast and probably win the game with, mm -hmm. or a Soul Cauldron in your hand, um, which lets one of your other creatures become a Hermit Druid and win right, the game that way. Right. <laughs> and the Noxious Revival to get back any card if they give you the Noxious mm -hmm. Revival. Understood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, that I like that. Um, how do you feel about uh, noxious? I mean, uh, intuition power. This intuition power when it comes, like it, I like because it's not very mana intensive. That's what I do like about it. But in those situations where they give you the hermit druid, um, do you usually use a Londo to get around the summoning sickness it'll get for the turn, or how do you mm -hmm. kind of navigate when? Uh, how do you prep going into this intuition line? What kind of setup are you looking for? Uh, most of the time, your your turns generally involve. Uh, drawing a card for turn and passing because you normally are leaving up interaction for the cards in your hand or Alondo and Alondo activations because you can act, ca activate and, and cast everything on somebody's end step. Um, Understood. On the player before you use end of turn, uh, leading with an intuition um, and forcing them to give you that a Hermit Druid, um, as long as you have one untapper for alondo it guarantees you a hasty alondo or a hasty hermit druid on your yeah. turn uh, understood so you... yeah that's true that's true that's true oh that's mm. beautiful okay mm -hmm. and i so we all like that that actually makes a lot of sense and I, what i love about this because i played around with intuition in my marnius list and other lists and the only thing that i've never been a huge fan about intuition is that outside of the breach intuition lines intuition lines can be very very expensive and so mm -hmm. my question is well i mean not even as a question I, it's very clear to see like this intuition line like at most is costing us what two colorless and a green if they give you the act of the soul cauldron which is not very expensive throwing maybe a little bit of extra mana that may it may cost to uh do the flashback card for one green so that's two green and two colorless is that's basically all you need to win at that point, mm -hmm. right? And maybe two blue uh, one at six mana all together for the Thoughts Oracle. Yeah, two two blue, two green, and two colorless for the, the Soul Cauldron. That's not bad. Mm -hmm. Six mana ain't a lot of CDH. That's <laughs> not a lot it's of mana. Really and we and we play a deceptively high number of, you know, mana dorks and we play all the little rocks because all of our untappers are also mana dorks. Mm, okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. I like that. Uh, mm -hmm. I like that. Okay. All right. Any other intuition lines you wanted to touch on? Um, sometimes you can intuition for uh, three just win conditions, free from the Rear of Heavens or Illusionist Bracers, depending on your board state, and they just have to give you a win condition. Um, <laughs> sometimes right. you can, you know, do the, the value intuition where um, say, hey, this person's trying to win the game, give me this fierce guardianship. Um, and you know, it lets you entomb a fate stitcher and a deep analysis just just for fun, or a, a fate stitcher and a malevolent hermit just to to get that value uh, uh, off of the two cards in the graveyard. Hundred percent, yeah, mm -hmm. I definitely hear you there. I know another fun intuition line that I love doing is if you have turn one, man, uh, soul ring. I mean, uh, turn one mana crypt land. You can always intuition for mystic remora the one ring and a rhystic study is like i don't care what you give me i'm i'm drawing cards i don't care what you mm -hmm. give me so it's definitely always nice to be in those those situations like where it's such a flexible tutor yeah mm -hmm. anything with intuition you want else to talk about uh, talk about brother another intuition kind of pile that you can get is mobilize vitalize and dramatic reversal if you really need that that kind of stormy type turn oh. um Basically, all three of those spell just say untap either all of your creatures or all of your your non land permanents. Right. Um, so if you are are kind of storming through your turn, as you can sometimes do in this deck, um, being able to just 
cast a Vitalize for one green, untap your Orlando, and three other untappers let you get four cards deeper or whatever, you know? Understood. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I love that. I ain't gonna cap. It allows you to be really explosive and just really, by knowing what it's telling me, what you're telling me basically is like, by knowing the deck better, you know when you see this intuition and once you draw it, it's like, okay, no matter how I want to, no matter how like I use this spell, I know it can get me one step closer to a win or even mm -hmm. interact with my opponents, but it still puts me towards a win, which I fucking love, man. Mm -hmm. I love that. Okay. All right. So you just got done talking about one tutor. Are there any other tutors that help us put together these intricate combo lines? Um, crop rotation is is definitely one. Um, I have a, a section down below that's just the, the tutors in the deck. Okay. Um, it's a, a tags for them. Um, crop rotation tends to be really, really powerful. Um, we have a lot of crop rotation targets, and there's a, a, a tag for the crop rotation targets uh, mm. somewhere in here as well. Cool. Um, just under the card advantage one. Um, okay. But we've got we've got five really good crop rotation targets. Uh, crop rotation plus our Druid's charm because they kind of do basically the same thing. Right. Um, right. Right. Because our Druid's charm just does everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, oh, I'm seeing a lot of great ones. We got the Cephalic Coliseum. We got the Manamo. If you have the One Ring, or if you just honestly. That untaps our commander as well. Of course, mm -hmm. we talked about the Nykthos Shrine of Nyx and the Gaia's Cradle. Cannot leave home without it. And of course, mm -hmm. can't leave home without the Forbidden Orchard, the ultimate. This is a bad card in every every other deck, but it's a goat in our deck. Man, I it's love great. it. Okay. Being, being able to uh, activate Forbidden Orchard more than once in a turn on somebody else's turn and give somebody two one 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 spirits or three one one spirits letting them block a timna or block a najila and and the token they make off of it uh, people don't expect it and it's it works so much more than you would think <laughs> <laughs> i believe i believe you i believe you oh that is one of the some of the biggest mistakes that i've seen made like the old arm swing with ragavan but you forget to attack the person with forbidden orchard and they so <laughs> They just float mm -hmm. the mana, give someone else the spirit, and you could do, um, as you kind of say, you could do the same thing with Timna, tap it multiple times and go ahead and just kill the person's hidden, and that's, that's a waste of three mana, eight mana, because they got to recast her mm -hmm. for five. Oh, mm -hmm. man, that's good. Okay. Yes, and right. it works with other people's Forbidden Orchards, too. <laughs> she! <laughs> Who say you don't work together in CDH? Okay. So you yeah. talked you talk a little bit about crop rotation. You brought up Arcjewish Charm as well. Talk to me about that, brother. <laughs> Archdrew with Charm is just kind of a glue, does everything pretty good kind of card. Um, it's a two hand creature tutor, it's a two play land tutor, uh, one one counter and fights a thing, just gets rid of the, the Drana and Lindvala or Draineth Magistrate or yep. whatever's, whatever's being real annoying. Exile target artifact or enchantment just gets rid of their Underworld Breach or their Ristic Study or their Curse Totem. Yep. Um, or the one it's ring a, or the one ring <laughs> <laughs> uh you know the we it's part of our uh one of our instant speed wind lines if we don't have fast as oracle mm -hmm. it's it it's a very good glue card it just does everything mm. <laughs> and most of the time we don't care that much about the triple green because we're casting it for free from alando after four activations <laughs> very true very true very true i see what you're saying i love how you mm -hmm. get around that active that uh casting cost i know one reason a lot of decks haven't been messing with it is because that casting cost but i love how once again we're leveraging our commander to get around this card that's generically good but it's mm -hmm. also like okay it's generically good but it gets better once we are able to just cheat the cast and cost on it, which is fucking yeah. amazing. Okay, cool. And, and we're on the great, all, all, all the green mana dorks, and you know we can just cast it for triple green, and it's not usually that big a deal. Facts, honestly, you can get this out as early as turn two. Honestly, mm -hmm. drop a one, uh, turn one mana dork, play another land, and you're there. Sheesh, bro, this is nuts. turn turn one if you really need to. You Elvish Spirit Guide, Chrome Box Land. You know, true that. If, that if, is you, true. If, you're, if you got it, you can, you can you can fire it off if you really need to. Jeez, man, like I can see a universe where you see somebody, you see a Kenan drop a turn one one ring and you, they drop their Seaborn music in hand and be like, all right, let's just get one of this round, get rid of this one ring right now. Oh, mm -hmm. man. Okay, really good. Okay, cool. So I'm also seeing a Court of Calling and Finale Devastations as some put into battlefield effects. Okay, 
uh anything i know you kind of talked about cheating in thasa's oracle with these and finale being a finisher but anything special we want to talk about these tutors um quarter calling you know instant speed hermit druid on somebody's end step mm -hmm. real great uh can sometimes be an instant speed endurance also real great um you know stopping those underworld breach players you know mm. we've got a lot of you know spell skite that's another one that you know protects our combo wins it, yes. it does all the things that you want a, a, a two battlefield green tutor to be doing yep um court of calling is just a powerful card uh, a little awkward because you don't want to exile it to alondo because the x will be zero if you cast it through him and you yeah. don't have any zero targets but you know you gotta play the good ones at some point um Finale of Devastation not only is uh, a win condition for us because you can do the, the 10 or greater because we can generate infinite mana. Right. Um, it does all of the normal find a seed worm use things, but can also bring bringing stuff back from the graveyard. Um, that's one of the things that uh, you want to do with Fate Stitcher sometimes. So because if you have a Gaios Cradle in play or a crop rotation to get a Gaios Cradle in play, bringing back Fate Stitcher untapping the Gaius Cradle uh, for four lets you cast Finale and bring the Thassa's Oracle back from your graveyard um, mm. using only green mana instead of blue mana. I, I see what you're saying. Okay, 100%. That makes sense. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And par particularly for the Unctus lines, for sure. Understood, yeah. That is a good catch as well. I've been there. I'm sure we've all been in the situation where it's just like, oh, I have win, but... I don't have the colors I need to get there. And so being able to say, okay, like, all right, I don't have the two blue mana to cast a thousand, but I, I can go ahead, put this finale into my hand instead and just use all the excess green I have from the guy's cradle or whatever other green source to get across. So I do love that. Very well thought about. Very good. Okay, cool. Yeah. It's, it's part of one of the, one of the things about the Unctus lines in the deck is you it, it's de that one's going to be one that takes more experience mm. to know exactly how many cards you have in hand and what exactly you need those cards to be. Um, right, right, right. Understood. So, uh, if there is a learning curve for the, for this that win condition, Unctus is is definitely not the most straightforward. Um, but yeah, there as long as you have some number of cards in hand as long as you have as long as you don't have zero cards in hand Unctus <laughs> will win the game basically 100 percent. and if we could just read quickly touch back on Unctus, if you all are not familiar Unctus is a blue a two blue and one colorless artifact legendary creature that's a phyrexian vandalkin and it says other blue creatures you control have whenever this creature becomes tapped draw a card then discard a card and the reason my brother martian is saying Yo, be conscious about having cards in hand. And also you may need to think about how many cards you wanna have in hand is because you're not just purely drawing cards, you're looting. So you're drawing cards and discarding cards as part of the resolution. So if you have no cards in hand, you're just filling up your graveyard, which is fine if you already have thousands in hand. But if, like I've said, if you had no cards in hand, so how do you have thousands in hand? And so mm -hmm. it's definitely something you wanna think about. Uh, is, there any, ever, is there ever any times where you maybe want to cycle your whole deck into the graveyard and you just need the mana to put like to finale or like maybe flash something back to bring your thoughts back from the graveyard from uh straight from the graveyard to the battlefield um, or do you always have to have a card in hand to start the loop that's part of why we run deep analysis even if you have no cards in hand being able to draw and discard until you discard the deep analysis cast mm. the deep analysis letting to those two cards in hand lets you usually piece piece something together to actually win the game that way got Whether you got you so you know, very the last two cards are Gaia's cradle and finale to to re to bring the fast circle back from the graveyard or um you know sometimes you know i'm trying to think of another situation sometimes you need the utopia sprawl and the pemenzora because you're you have a lot of mana but no way to or you have a lot of mana but no way to go infinite mana hmm. um, deep analysis letting you get two cards and letting you piece together you know some of your two card combos that way um lets you lets you get get there most of the time that makes 100 percent sense once again another card that we don't get to see too often in cdh but it become like makes just a lot of sense because Colors in a blue and three life ain't shit when you have 40 life and all the resources that you get when you just get to churn through your deck. So I love how you get to make card draw out of nothing. So I love that. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
watch out for a deflecting swap but uh we'll cross that bridge when we get there <laughs> yes the de deflecting swap can you know it's just a really good card for a reason <laughs> <laughs> it's a reason all the decks are running it okay yeah and uh Finally, for the tutors, we have two tutors left, a Sylvan Tutor and a Worldly Tutor, both top deck tutors for a creature of your choice, one sorcery speed, one instant speed. So tell me tell me about how you feel about both of these. And yeah, go ahead, Burr. Um, because we break timing restrictions, we don't care that Sylvan Tutors are sorcery. We're going to cast it as an instant anyway. Oh, <laughs> and then yeah. we just have two copies of Worldly Tutor. Um, <laughs> Damn. And... One of the things about both of these is normally they'd be a uh, card disadvantage, um, but the, when we're casting them through our Alondo activations, uh, effectively Alondo replaces every card that you're exiling to him. So basically it staples draw a card onto onto every spell that you cast. So it, it's, basi it's net neutral in terms of card in hand for both of these spells when you cast them from your commander. Mm, break that down for me one more time. So you're saying it's net neutral because every time you cast Alondo, you will, you, you activate Alondo, you'll exile this card, mm -hmm. you'll cast you're, it, get the card yeah. on top, and then you'll draw it again. Or how, how does how is this breaking uh, parity and being net neutral one more time? Uh, it's net neutral because when on the turn that you exile it to Alondo, you're also drawing a card with the Alondo ability. Um, so the following activation, you're drawing a card again, and then you're casting it. Got you, got you, got you, hundred yeah. percent. Okay, cool. So it's it's not actually card disadvantage with either of these top deck tutors through your commander. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Okay, cool. I like that. All right, so with that being said, we talked about tutors, we talked about win cons, but we also we want to talk about some card draw. So tell me tell me about your card draw package, brother. Um, we've got classic Mystic Ristic One Ring. Oh, can't leave home without it. And of there, course, there. you know, we, we've talked about Mr. Alondo a lot. Beautiful mm -hmm. thing about this commander is we have the card draw in the command zone as well, which yeah. is beautiful. Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, Anything deep analysis in there just because you know sometimes you just exile it to Alondo and it draws you two cards. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I'm seeing right here, of course, we've already talked about crop rotation packets, but we also have this Sepulchre Coliseum. Any other times where you see this draw three cards and discard three cards as being a benefit for you, or is like for car hand filtering your hand, or is it usually just a let's just get the Thassus Oracle player because they forgot we had a Cephalus on board? Um, sometimes you can crop rotation into a cephalid and kill the Thassa's Oracle player. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty rare that you would target yourself with this to, to draw three and discard three, but I have done it. Um, if you don't have an Unctus in play and you really want to discard your Fate Stitcher, that's a way you can do it. Um, for, for the haste and unearth ability on Fate Stitcher, um, I've done that before. Okay. Um, ah, very good. So it mm -hmm. it's less of a card draw effect and more of a graveyard filler. Mm -hmm. Got you. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. All right. Um, another thing it can do is because Archdruid's Charm lets us put the land into play, and because Unctus lets us draw and discard to re to reactivate the threshold ability, um, through Endurance Loops we can actually force our opponents to draw three and discard three their, through their entire library at instant speed. That's our secondary way to um, oh my win God. the game at instant speed without fast Oracle. So, okay, so you said using Endurance on ourselves mm -hmm. to reshuffle in after we've activated. So we, so basically we make infinite mana, mm -hmm. then we of green and blue and colorless and of the rainbow, you know what I'm saying? Purple, yeah. lavender, whatever not. We make infinite mana, and then at this point we loop Archdruid's Charm, Fate Stitcher, and Cephalic Coliseum by Archdruid's Charming putting this land into play, Fate Stitcher to untap it, and then using the blue mana to sacrifice and force our opponents to draw, and we just loop that infinitely. Yes. You don't even, it doesn't necessarily even need to be Fate Stitcher. It can be any of your untappers that can untap a land. Understood. Um, because every time we're actually going infinite and making infinite mana, it also involves untapping whatever we want. Um, 
whether it's uh, Femmins or Free from the Illusionist Bracers, whatever, yeah. or, or Intruder Alarm, we can untap whatever we want. So the, the land coming into, plat, into play tapped off of Archdruid Charm doesn't matter. Um, and then um, either through killing your own endurance or bouncing it or um, kind of whatever you want, you, you loop endurance uh, over and over, putting the Cephalid Coliseum and the Archdruid Charm back in, including the endurance. Um, draw again um, until you get Archdruid's Charm, put Archdruid's Charm, put the Cephalid Coliseum back into play, and activate it again, targeting your opponents over and over again. And is this something that you would put infinite activations on the stack all at once, or is it, is it usually okay if each draw trigger resolves? Because I can see a universe because we're not in white, we don't have a silence effect, and I have not seen a defense grid. How do we avoid those opponents find the, re the removal spell or end of act to peace within the iteration of drawing and discarding? Um, because of the way our commander operates, um, most of the time, no matter what our opponents draws, we can just do it again over top of whatever counter spell or removal spell or whatever they have. Understood. Um, the only time it is sometimes relevant is with split second effects. So exactly Angel's Grace. Yeah. In which case we just wait until the end of turn and then we kill them again on their upkeep. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, sure. Right, right. Understood, understood, understood. Um, yeah, that makes it. Okay, that makes me feel better. Yeah. Because the only yeah. thing a lot of times that people like, they'll just, they'll say, oh, come let me draw yourself out. Hold on. Like, there's, is this just all one draw or you, do I have inner. Are there steps and phases in between where I, between where I have the uh, the ability to interact? So that's very. I'm very glad that you brought that up. Okay, that makes me feel better. Okay, cool. All right, so we, go ahead. Brother. Sacrifice yeah. is part of the activation cost. You can just put all of the triggers on the stack all at once. Um, ah, that's true. Because you sacrifice it, you target the player, start mm -hmm. the loop again, and you do it again and again and do it all at instant speed. And it doesn't matter. Okay, well, I'm going to react in between of until I get my angel's grace. Okay, that's fine. That like, I'm just going to keep put like the mid, like, I'm going to keep put. Well, no, the split second is the only problem. You can get around channel abilities and spells, but the split second is the one problem. But the only problem is like, okay, I don't care anymore because I could do it in your upkeep as well. Yeah. And that just assumes we don't have a Thassa's Oracle to just win ourselves as opposed to forcing everybody else to lose. Right, uh, right, right. That makes 100% sense. Okay. Yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. So we just got talking about some, that done talking about our some banging card draw effects. Deep analysis, honestly, like you're making me looking at this card a little bit harder in any graveyard decks. But of course, don't leave home without Mystic, Ristic, and the One Ring. But with that said, like we're drawing cards, we're tutoring, we're trying to win the game through these these very intricate, beautiful lines. But let's talk about ways to protect ourselves. But before we do that, actually, let's talk about ways we interact with our opponents first. So how are we how are we interacting, remove, and uh, having some removal spells in this deck? Uh, we're in blue. We get all the good counter spells. We love that. Okay. Um, you will notice in this particular list, we're a little higher on creature and artifact removal because we hate Curse Totem. Um, um, very true. And also Orcish Bowmasters. Um, that's part of why Spell Snare is in here. Um, gotcha. We, we, we hate all of the two mana costs things. Um, Geranith, Bowmasters, Curse Totem, yeah. um, Breach, Dockside, Thoracle, Tainted Pact. Um, there's a lot of two mana spells that are just really good to be countering right now. And I think spell snare has been great. Mm, uh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so we, we've got all the normal blue, blue interactive spells. Uh, we've got a mangle horn down there for a cursed totem. Yeah. Um, malevolent hermit itself on, even on the front side is, is a really good, you know, kind of a rattlesnake on the battlefield to gotcha. pay one blue and, and counter a non-creature unless they pay three, which is not dear. It's, it's a good amount of mana. It is. Yes literally um, we've got both of the channel lands we've got uh legolas's quick reflexes <sighs> in here love this card this card has been spectacular uh if you could if if you were to create a one mana you know kind of protection spell for this deck it would have every word that quick reflexes has on it <laughs> it was Man. it was exact it was it was almost like they designed that card for this deck it was <laughs> 
and the they just they had to throw split second on it as well that's my mm -hmm. favorite part about it as well because i've had so many games where it's just like i have the removal spell with the problem it's like two different players waiting to go off and i'm like all right whoever tries to go off first i got the removal spell and then that person just pops off yeah i'm gonna let go of those quick reflexes damn mm -hmm. not only can i not counter it i can't put nothing else in the stack until it's already mm -hmm. resolved oh man yeah, yeah. I love this card yes let's see not not only does it protect your Orlando and give you an extra untap of it so you can activate it again um and and this in that next time deal three damage to whatever creature you want um the Draneth holding you back or whatever um it can also just be a one-sided board wipe with a Fedo Alchemist and Seeker of Skybreak just that one too um you can uh, infinitely deal one damage or two damage, depending on which one you're using, to every creature your opponents control. Yes. Man. Uh, over and over again. And they just all die. Man, and because Alondo is a, oh, it's a three. So you basically have a lightning bolt on the, a lightning bolt on the stick. So then with infinite uh, Alondo activations, you basically, do, yeah, this, all the creatures are gone and just... Mm -hmm. Man, I wish this said target creature or player because this would that would be a win combat. But I guess it would be a win if only. <laughs> if only, man. Okay, all right. Well, we'll, we'll wait for them for the, We'll wait for them to print that card. Okay. I'm also seeing all the forces: force, will, force negation, and force of vigor. Once again, I'm guessing for that good curse totem we've talked a bit about. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, everything looks pretty standard. Um, love seeing the psych rift only one board wipe in this list has that ever become any have has that ever been a problem for you or is that one cyclonic rift board wipe just usually good enough to get the job done um cyclonic rift is usually just good enough to get the job done like i said like less quick reflexes can also just be a board wipe True. a, a, a good amount of the time um there's also just not, many, not that many good ones in these colors uh i've tried march of swirling mist and it's only been okay yeah um, the things that we want to get rid of we would prefer them stay gone for longer than a, a phased turn yeah um especially yeah. when like when grand abolish and ranger captain of the Eels and other silence based creatures are just warping the meta right now like it's it's mm -hmm. very clear that they're super powerful and march just does nothing against them because you phase them out but oh they can come back at the beginning of the, uh of the upkeep and it's like well when they come back I, i'm silenced again <laughs> so it kind of defeats the purpose for them and even though i do love march of swirling mist it's just not gonna it's not gonna crack it against these uh silence effect creatures which are just like i said if you're running white you're running these silence creatures so yeah i definitely need there brother okay yeah basically like, there's just not that many good ones in these colors unfortunately we're we're waiting for we're waiting for another one in uh, modern horizons 3. we're waiting for a good green one actually i think <laughs> i think i think that's that's where i'm putting my money no you and me both i was just doing some research on some one-sided board wipes because in my marnius list i just want to have one more board wipe like right now i'm i uh took toxic deluge out because i'm like it's good but sometimes i want to be able to have that single uh that single uh target removal as well i love the flexibility and I've, I've thought about like the the model white uh overload spell but then just paying six mana to to do it can literally literally time walk you so it's like you're losing the benefit of wiping the board so it's it's tough there's been like i feel like i would love a good another like another one side of board wipe we got d, d may saying please god green needs good stuff Green Green does need a couple more good cards. I'm not gonna lie, like they've got like Legolas's quick reflexes was a great include. Cutso, mm -hmm. the Warrior Cat was a good include, but I feel like Mono Green hasn't been getting a lot of great things. But it's like Green Plus is killing it because you got the Neo Form and the uh, um, what's that ritual spell? Uh, not Cabal Ritual, Calling Ritual, Calling Ritual, and the other things. It's like Green Cut Plus is killing it. It's like the Mono Green was like, hey guys. Help this color out. Give them their dock side or their underworld reach or whatever you need to give them to let them be able to stick out and have their juggernaut in their color. So yeah, yeah. I definitely use there. Quick, quick reflexes, arch druid charm, and and uh, delighted halfling were all three like they were okay. They're decent. They're good enough to play, but like yeah, we Del delighted it's, halfling. It's twenty twenty four. We can't be team or saber tooth and now. <laughs> team or saber tooth <laughs> needs to go. <laughs> No, I hear you there, man. Delighted half, uh, delighted half was definitely something. What I remember when it came out, everyone was super bullish. But I've been seeing slowly but quickly, it's just been sliding out of list because just 
it only being able to tap our color if you have legendary creatures kind of makes it tough to run outside of sensei because it's like if this is only cast my commander and tapping for colors outside of that like i can see where you can maybe use it in kennen and other things that may uh tap like you can use the extra color created by kennen i believe you can get around that interaction with that but outside of that you're just not being able to use that colors as effectively like you may be able to use a birds of paradise to tap for any color or any of the other elves or whatever not so yeah green green still definitely does need some help i definitely could agree but i also like we've talked about a great interaction package i'm seeing a lot of great spells nothing that really you know surprises me not seeing any stifle effects but i don't is this what you say this dex archetype is just pure mid range a little control or turbo where would you put this deck at uh somewhere between tempo and mid range probably like okay. said, a, a lot of your turns you end up just drawing your card for turn playing your land or what if you have one and passing the turn because you do play so much at instant speed mm. um so we, we can play some uh a, a good you know heads up control game plan and play play responsibly um throughout the game but gotcha. we we don't need to if we don't have want to understood that makes sense yeah 100 percent sense. okay cool so we got some interaction to stop our opponents and interact with our opponents with their game plans. But now I want to talk about ways for protecting ourselves because we have multi-piece combos. So we got to be able to protect our board state. So mm -hmm. talk to me about your protection package. Uh, we don't get Grand Abolisher, sadly. Um, we, we don't get Silence. We don't get Grand Abolisher. We do have uh, things that try their best. <laughs> <laughs> 100%. Um, we, we do get Destiny Spinner. Destiny Spinner, uh, creatures and enchantments. We care about both of those things, and then not being able to be countered is is real strong. Mm -hmm. uh, the second ability is another win condition uh, when you're looping our steward charm over and over again because we run I want to say nine or ten enchantments, so we yes. can put every land into play and turn them all into ten tens and <laughs> with trample and haste and and kill everybody that way because we run you know, twenty eight lands, twenty seven lands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that may it, yeah. It, it pulls double duty that way sometimes if, okay. if you're out of options. Um, like I said, we, we talked about the benevolent geist. Mm -hmm. uh, Non-creature spells being not being able to be counter, be countered is is really, really good. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we got Spellskite. And Spellskite's, you know, it's not Grand Abolisher, but it tries its hardest. <laughs> no, I definitely hear you there. What are some, what are some good scenarios you've seen Spellskite be a, a, just a, a powerhouse for you in this deck? Uh, stops kiki jiki loops it stops nice. uh, somebody trying to chain a vapor or uh hole breaker horror their own stuff mm -hmm. um, somebody tries to hole breaker horror and and bounce their mana crypt you can redirect that and stop their stop their chain that way sometimes yeah. um, they said the chain of vapor um forcing uh those underworld breach tricks to to get a little more creative with their ritual type mana mm -hmm. um you know, Spellskite redirecting a removal spell from one of your, your creatures trying to, to be a combo piece. Um, you know, protecting and, and going back to the Spellskite. Been really strong. Um, sneakily good with against Ottawara as well. Yeah, um, yep. That's, that's <laughs> one that none of the other ones can protect against, and Spellskite does really good at, at that. Um, yeah. No, hundred percent. Yeah, we actually got uh, Fidel dropping in uh, Dosin, so I'm not seeing the Dosin. And I also want to bring up the uh, I just said it earlier. What is the artifact? The two mana artifact, y'all. Chat, tell me what is this two mana artifact called again? Uh, everything costs three defense more. Grid. Defense, defense grid. grid. Thank you. Tell me. So I'm not. We're not seeing defense grid or a Dosin, and. I'm pretty sure I could tell, I could say why it's not the list, but please uh, t tell the audience, why, why are we not seeing a Dofsin or a Defense Grid on this list? Both of those spells basically say your commander can't do the things it wants to do at instant speed. <laughs> yep. Uh, we, we love winning at instant speed, so having either of those in play, um, should we get stopped or should we try and cast them on somebody else's turn with a Londo just gives them protection and yeah. that's not really something we want to be doing we want to be able to to keep activating yeah and casting our spells yeah I really wish I really wish those were cards you can run this list but with you so commonly wanting to do similar to how Sisse can win on top of the stack 
Um, you got this. There's so many decks nowadays. Part of the reason they're powerful is the fact they. Uh, I know another the mono red. Uh, oh my gosh, what is the mono red? Uh, uh, oh, uh, oh my Mag god, Magda. Magda. Thank you. Oh my gosh, Magda. Li literally, the common play pattern with that is to have the win and then to just pass the turn and be like, all right, well, I have the win, but there's no reason for me to jam it right now. I'm just going to wait for someone else to try to present a wins con or put a grand about or something else on the stack and then let them commit mana to it. And then I'm just going to boom, da, 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 and I'm just going to win right on top. So mm -hmm. I really wish this deck could do that with those docents and defense grids. But since you have to cast spells in during your loops and you actually like it's kind of like you shut yourself down to be able to mm -hmm. win on top of people. It kind of does suck a little bit, but hey, you got to pay the piper somehow. You got to balance, balance it out uh, in some pro in some of the ways. So that makes sense, I guess. Yeah. Okay. I should quick... that... go ahead, brother. Yeah. I was going to say that's that's one of the things that reasons why we like these kinds of combos is because they are so resilient mm. and we can just win again on top of somebody else's interactive spell. Right. Um, so. Yeah. No, I definitely do feel that. Quick side question: uh, Since your commander is cast, is your com your commander is he casting these spells uh, yeah. during during resolution? Correct. Yes. So, how do you find that you're able to win when there's a Ristic study or a Mystic Remora on board? Um, it usually depends on what kind of win condition we're going for. Okay. Um, Intruder Alarm, Freed from the Real, Hemanzora, and Illusionist Bracers all are able to just generate its infinite mana. Got you. Uh, when we're doing it. Um, sorry, if you can hear my dog, she's pressing buttons. <laughs> <laughs> you're good, you're good. Um, but yeah, it, it those are usually the, the win conditions that we go for when we need to generate infinite mana and pay for the Ristic Studies. Gotcha, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I said, and, and when people do have those kinds of effects in play, like I said, we're for most of the time just leaving up all of our lands and mana dorks anyways because we're not actually using our using them to cast our spells we're using our commander right um, so we usually just have mana laying around a lot of the time to to pay for those triggers got you that makes sense okay cool cool all right so with that said great protection package like i said i really wish you can use dosen because i love dosen uh but we can't unfortunately it's okay but do we have any stacks pieces in these in this deck to slow our opponents down? Uh, mostly just Manglehorn, sometimes Spellskite. Um, I also like to call Agatha Soul Cauldron kind of a stacks piece. Dude. Um, it it pulls a lot of work. Yep. Um, yeah, it's it, it's really really strong at at just doing a lot of the little things that we want the card to do. Um, sniping yep. a, a Ranger Captain of Eos, sniping a Dothy Voidwalker. Uh, sniping somebody's LED, somebody, sniping somebody's, you know, reanimator target, Razaketh, lurking around the around the way. Um, giving our own creatures untap abilities, turning turning our Alanoir <laughs> elves into a into a, a thing that untaps any permanent. Um, yeah. I guess it, it does a lot of just little things on top of just being a decent kind of graveyard hate piece. Yeah. Yeah, this is de this is definitely one of those things where like I've had so many games where people would just for forget it's on board and it sh it just turns breach off. It's basically just another version of Gravdigger's Cage because you can never begin a, uh, a breach loop without having to deal with the Ag Agatha Soul Cauldron first. Because the minute you try to put stuff in your graveyard to start any type of loop, it's over. You know what I'm saying? They're going to snipe off the pieces you want. And because you have so many untappers and tappers, it's not just one piece. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. every piece. So I definitely hear you there, brother. Agathus is a crazy, basically a crazy stacks piece in the deck. And yeah, yeah. I, I like to see Mango Horn here. Like, um, we haven't got to, we're, we're about to talk about our ramp pieces, but uh, I'm guessing you do have a good sum or just enough artifacts in this deck that would make you want to run the Mango Horn. I'm believing, right? Yeah, we 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 have a few Mango, a few artifacts. Not a lot. I want to say 13 or so. Okay. Last time I counted. Um, you know, it enters the battlefield, like it blows up curse totems and and annoying stuff. Um, another thing I think I forgot to mention is uh, what was I about to say. Take your time, brother. You good. Uh, oh, I got the Soul Cauldron is legendary. We can untap it with Manamo. People forget that all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
So is there any loops that you that you incorporate Manamo and Agathas with that? Or is that just like a like no like a one off? Like I'm gonna tap my Agathas to make you make you commit to something and kind of just f- pump fake them and kind of do something quick with it. You see, you can usually you can a lot of times pump fake them with it. Um, we can also part of our Cephalid Coliseum, you know, loop is even if they have some way to shuffle, if you're against a random Gitrog deck with Eldrazi Titans and stuff, you yeah. can exile their entire graveyard while you're you're forcing them to draw and discard with the Soul Cauldron. So so even the the shuffle Titan effects just don't even matter. Because you exile in the stack art, you'll get that one shuffle effect. But once that's over, it's just like you're dead. Oh, okay, that's good. That's good. That's good. Okay, cool. All right, so we got an amazing. We not not a huge stacks package, but it's fine because we trying to win the game. We ain't trying to stop other people. We got a good control package as well with our interaction. But let's we got to get there. We need to get there fast because CDH is not a turn twenty format. It's uh, we're talking turn four to six if you're in the mid range kind of thing. Maybe three to six, honestly. So let's talk about our ramp package and these mana sources. Talk to me. We run all the dorks. Uh, we, ain't, we ain't scared of no bowmasters around here. We can't really <laughs> play around it anyways. So why why adjust our deck to, to play against something we can't beat anyway? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. We, we can beat a bowmasters. We we do it a lot. Um, yeah. Like I said, a lot of our, our interaction suite is geared against bowmasters, whether it's removal spells or counter spells. Yeah. Um, we've got a Fimage and a Gildan Drake in the in the creature package, both of which you know interact profitably with them. Yeah. Um, on top of that, a lot of our creatures just have you know three or five toughness. You know, our, our commander doesn't die to bowmasters. A lot yeah. of our untappers have three toughness that it's going to take a while before they they shoot them down. Yeah, I hear you there. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, like I said, we we run all the mana dorks. All of our untappers are also mana sources. We run all the normal rocks. Very true. Uh, Mana Crypt Soul Ring, Mana Vault. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm looking at this. Everything looks really good. We're running also. I, of course, you brought Utopia's problem. We're also seeing a wild growth here. Everything looks good. It's no complaints. It's uh it's it's not very common to see all the Elvish Mystic Land of War Elves, but Finhorn Elves, but and Finhorn Elves, but you brought up already like now. Fuck fuck Orcish Bowmasters. You know what I'm saying? Y'all Orcish Bowmasters can suck a dick, bro. Like we gonna play through it. We we don't care how it happens, we just gonna play through it and we gonna get through it. So and of course we've already talked on Delighted Halfling making our commander uncounterable because you know uh we do have a commander signature deck but a deck that can also win without a commander so i'm not mad at this and of course arbor elf, elf as well um if we look at our land sources i think our arbor elf targets are breeding pool i'm seeing oh we're running the surveil land we'll get to that in a sec but the hedge maze and of course uh the tropical islands well okay how often i gotta be honest how often are we seeing this arbor elf not doing a damn thing be honest with me brother it's pretty rare. We we find our fetch lands pretty pretty consistently. Okay. Uh, we okay. run we run all of the ones that we can, um, in our in our colors, which is seven fetches plus the three um, forest island lands brings it up to ten uh, ten lands that that it does it with. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's it's pretty rare that that it's turned off, um, and when it is turned off, you're probably not keeping that hand in the first place. Um, unless it's really good for other reasons. Um, yeah. In which case you don't really care that if you don't have your mana dark, you probably have a mana crypt or something. <laughs> right, right, right. I definitely do hear that. Yeah, I'm seeing, like, speaking of land bases, though, like, um, we're, as looking through, you are running all the fetches, which is good to hear. We want to make sure that we hit our uh, land bases. Uh, quick question Are you ever finding that running all the fetch lands for your color, you run out of fetchable targets? Because I'm not seeing any basic lands we are a hammer druid deck we don't get to run basic lands of course um, right they said the the printing of hedge maze has been really really strong the survey land being the third fetchable target God. um definitely gives us that that extra fetchable target making them a lot a lot less likely to be dead and even if they are dead in the late game we just exile them to our commander and discard them to unctus we don't we don't really care if we need to fetch them because then we just find some other land to play anyways mm, i hear that i hear that so we just at this point it's just filter just fodder bs you know what mm. i'm saying when we yeah. oh we just need cards for unctus to be able to start the loop of drawing and discarding i got you i got mm-hmm. you so it, just yeah. hold on to a couple of fetch lands okay that doesn't hurt okay cool yeah, it's it's usually not a problem 
Okay. Um, yeah. The third fetchable source has been really good. The hedge maze has been really, really good. Um, I've done stuff with the uh, the surveil trigger on the stack, cast a worldly tutor, and entomb my fate stitcher. Um, you know, tricky tricky stuff like that. Yeah. Um, like I said, there there are cards we want in the graveyard. I hear that. Uh, quick question, last thing for Hedge Mage. How has that mm -hmm. surveil outside of first of all that us having that another fetchable target for our fetch lands? How has that surveil actually done for you? Like it's still a fair, uh, seem a, a slightly a slightly new uh, land type. How's the surveil actually done for you though? Surveil's been great. Like I said, we're we're a mid range deck, and and you know having making sure our next draw isn't just garbage. Um, uh, being able to to surveil the that fetch land that isn't isn't doesn't have a target anymore into our graveyard, and then you know drawing a relevant piece after that has been has been great. It's been really solid. Like I said, and and we leave up all of our lands anyways, so you know fetching on somebody's end step to get the surveil land is is pretty easy to do and not not even a downside. Got you. Okay. Cool. Now, uh, let's see, we've, we've talked about everything. We're seeing agents who we've already talked about both our channel lands, the Cephalic Coliseum. Everything else looks pretty standard for, uh, for a good old Simic land base. Nothing too crazy. Um, and everything looks good. Of course, we see gemstone caverns, get that early ramp. We're seeing our battle bond lands. You know, hopefully our opponents don't concede, but we see the good old battle bond lands. Are there any other notable categories? And I already have a few in my head, but what are some other notable categories for this specific deck that you'd like to touch on? Um, we, we, we've got our untappers. I was um, waiting for you to say it. I was, was like, the same thing. Got, <laughs> I was waiting for it. I was like, we didn't even talk about the crux of this deck. <laughs> mm -hmm. Go ahead, brother. Uh, we've got 18 untappers. Oh my uh, gosh. Some of them are creatures. We've <laughs> got uh, what is effectively two different seedborn muses. Mm. Uh, we've got the good old classic actual seedborn muse, and then we've got quest for renewal. Okay. Um, I got to pause you there, brother. Because uh -huh. you about to skate over this one. One of my homies uh, <laughs> played this deck. I don't know. I don't know if he was running your list or another list. He said he played against you before. And when I saw Quest for Renewal, I was like, okay, we got like a turn or two. I kid you not, he played his vert. Like, I don't know how he shot so many counters on this thing so fast, but this is one of the scariest two mana enchantments in this deck, honestly, outside of the actual win cons. But it's like, it. you just talk about Quest for Renewal and how your deck just supercharges this deck to become a super, a Seaborn Muse and also, and, off, and honestly, almost one to two turns, man. It's it's almost always turned on the same turn we play it. Damn. <laughs> uh, Mana Dork Alondo plus one Untapper is turned on. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that's just busted. And then after that is just we're just sitting there just getting massive card advantage. If we have if we do do it like that with the Seaborn, I mean with the uh, with the um, Untapper as well, that means we're getting two Alondo activations every turn. And at that point, we're just waiting to shred through our deck at that point. That's just taking two counters off, drawing two cards, and just we're just at this point, the only thing that's stopping up is Dran stopping us is Dran at this point. But if we draw in that many cards, we're gonna get the counter spell or removal spell for Dran. So man, that's good to see. All right, keep talking to us though, bro. Uh yeah, we've got Quest Rindle, Seedborn Muse, uh, seen the uh, thousand year. Alarm. My apology for cutting you off, but we got a thousand year elixir too. This is very mm -hmm. interesting. Yep, thousand year elixir giving all of our things, you know that permanent not haste but effectively haste for the things that we care about doing yeah um i said that was the thousand year elixir was a, a part of my my game winning turn with four lands and no permanence in play because all of my all of my untapped creatures you know turned into an untap of a mana vault <laughs> <laughs> uh okay okay i hear you yeah oh shit that's true that's true mm -hmm. i hear you yeah no very good question. So I'm seeing with the thousand year elixir, there is an what is that planeswalker called? It came out last year and it was uh, Tyvar. Tyvar, yes. Mm -hmm. Have you ever? Well, no, it's blue, it's green, black. Okay. It's, it's, it's Golgari. It's not Simic. Man, like, okay. Oh, I just, 
in dream world just imagine with me for a second what tide bar if you could run tire bar jubilant brawler in this deck would this be something you would even run just in imaginary world yeah we would run it we would the really grapple <laughs> because i'm just looking i was just thinking about like why is he running tire bar of course it's outside the colors but dude like i'm looking at all these abilities it gives you the uh it gives you the ability from uh, the thousand year elixir. So your creatures that have active abilities, ha activated abilities have haste. It is an untapper itself, not to mention it mills you and lets you get your own recursion. So dude, like mm -hmm. I can see this honestly taking that uh, switching out for a thousand year elixir if it was in your colors, man. We'd probably play both. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. We'd find some way. It would probably come out for like mobilize, which is usually probably the worst of those that kind of ritual type uh, untap effect. Uh, um, got you. Could oh sorcery understood. Well, not mm -hmm. mean, but you get around it with your commander's ability. Yeah, yeah. Either way, yeah, yeah. I hear that. Mo mobilize and vitalize are effectively the same card in this deck. Yeah, true, true, true. Yeah, we got DMA saying tie him exclusively, baby. <laughs> yeah. We can't give we can't give a, a Londo all the good stuff. We gotta let Tyam have their joy. Okay, that's we fine. That's fair. Okay. We can't be we can't be tier one out here. We gotta <laughs> <laughs> gotta get skill skill based deck. It's a skill based deck. I definitely yeah. need there, okay? Um we've talked about pretty much all of these, like, oh, you're running dramatic ver dramatic reversal. I'm guessing mm -hmm. there's an Isochron Scepter as well actually no that is what is one of the the primary difference between this version and the the no bad cards version really um, okay. really so talk to me like that's very controversial but i want to hear your reason why are we not running isochron scepter when our commander so easily uh, combos with isochron scepter dramatic reversal in this list specifically a few different reasons um the number one is it tends to be um the easiest combo to interact with at this moment in time. It's true. Um, That's fair. Ev everything, everything interacts with dramatic or precise yep. concept or right Artifact, now. hate, Dranith, Magistrate, everything. Yep. Yep. Artifact, hate, Dranith, Magistrate, non-creature counters even. Yep. Um, another reason is the the increase in play of a lot of the, the blind obedience type effects. Yep. Having them come into play tap, just turning it off. Dauntless, Dismantler, Manglehorn, all of them, all of those cards seeing a lot more play than they used to. Yep. Um, and like I said, it, it always tended to be the most awkward because we want to use the bottom halves for Isochron Scepter like Dramatic Reversal for value so often. Mm. Um, just just to keep going on on any given turn when somebody's trying to combo off and win and trying to dig that bit deeper it tended to just be the the most interacted with and it also put a lot more emphasis on having your commander already be doing what it's doing um mm. which is why you'll see almost all of that package down in the sideboard basically all of those cards were replaced with hermit druid cards in this list gotcha i hear i hear what you're saying mm -hmm. okay yeah, yeah, yeah. We, okay. We replaced a combo that forced our commander to already be doing its thing to, with a combo that can win without our commander in play, basically. Understood. That that makes a hundred percent. Okay. That's a, a man. I I love to hear your explanation there because that is when you know someone's really been playing the deck. It is really. I have never thought that I would see a list run dramatic reversal without Isochron Scepter, but especially when your commander wins with it, but. You you gave solid reasons. It's like the epitome of like it's it's very interactive. I still run it in my Marnius list because I mean I just love it. It's super lean. It gets the the, the job done in Esper. Like um, within when you're drawing so many cards, you usually get the pieces you need. But it still is a combo that is highly interactable with. Um, mm -hmm. I love it, but at the same time, this is fair. Uh, I would hate to have to start a combo off and say, man, I can't keep doing the combo because I need to save the dramatic versal for the Isochron Scepter. You're sitting there now, nah, like, pass the dramatic versal. The value accrued from just casting it as a spell is higher than waiting for the Isochron Scepter. And that's very fair. Okay. And part of the reason it's it's better in, in decks that don't have a tap cost is you can have the Isochron Scepter combo and make the infinite mana and then cast your commander and then use that as the outlet. In a Londo, right. you already have to have a Londo in play and non-summoning sick in order for the combo to work in the first place. True. If it's assuming it's your outlet. Ah, you're right. So if a Londo gets removed in response to the Isochron Scepter, 
then now you're just sitting there and everyone's holding up interaction for you and like it just it just shuts everything down versus if you go at instant speed dramatic reversal you just let the combo keep going and keep going you just wait you just wait at that point you just have to wait as a pilot for the opportune time to cast the vitalize the dramatic reversal or the mobilize to get there versus trying to set up have the setup already there for the ice ground scepter and then you're only just one removal spell or one stacks piece away from it just being shut down or not even being possible of getting started yeah okay that makes a lot of sense very uh, it's tough to make those type of decisions but i think that was very wise for your deck i love i cannot wait to see this get played out brother okay all right so uh we pretty much talked about all the under tappers like you brought briefly Kiora's follower Kiora's follower really great untapper that can untap any other target permanent not just any artifacts or creatures like we're seeing a kelpie guide which is cool uh the low rift of the healing house and all these that we've already talked about most of these um of course you briefly brought up seaborn muse i think that kind of speaks for itself um you brought up vizier of the tumbling sands and yeah like just a lot of great untappers um fun question mm -hmm. tell me what a dream untapper would be or is it that you already have all the tappers you can dream about um if any of these three mana untappers were two mana that would be great <laughs> ah okay understood and yeah. is that for speed reasons is that for like you usually find it be they're too clunky or what what usually what incites that uh desire for a lower mana curve uh, the difference between what is effectively four Orlando activations in order to cast it as opposed to three is, is a pretty big difference mm. um, for every single one of these, um, the, every single one of the three mana ones at least. Understood. Um, so yeah, um, either another Kioros, more Kioros follower or even more, you know, Seeker of Skybreaks or a Fedo Alchemist that could untap themselves, you know. Um, gotcha. we, 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 we would take all the ones that we can get that at cheaper mana cost. <laughs> gotcha, <laughs> but, gotcha. Yeah, Watsi doesn't seem to be doing that anymore. Uh, <laughs> yeah, please. If you, I'm looking at the art uh, type for Vitalize and Mobilize, I'm looking like, yeah, these <laughs> these are yeah. old cards. I don't think they. I think they learned their lesson with one mana untap everything cards. I think they learned their lesson already. Okay, that's very fair. All right, okay. And if that's your dream card to get some more lower costs, which one of these? What would you say is your worst? untapper in this deck and one that you wish you just didn't have to run but you kind of just have to run it because it you just it just gets the job done for what you, it does currently it's probably kelpie guide I, I am probably replacing kelpie guide with one from um uh, not thunder junction the one right before that uh what's that uh chat what's that came out with right before thunder junction the the same one that hedge maze is from uh What set was that? That murders a car off manner. Murders a car off manner. What what what, yeah. uh, what car are we tra trading that out for? Uh, forensic researcher. Oh. It, the only difference is that it's a one three instead of a two two. Uh, three toughness is better than two toughness. <laughs> That's about it. Uh, is this <laughs> okay? So very interesting. Untap another target permanent you control. Tap it. Collect evidence three to tap. Tap target creature you don't control. Okay, cool. And then collect evidence is exile cards with total mana value, total mana value three or greater from your graveyard. Okay, yeah, it's, it's mostly just for the stat line difference. They're basically the same card. <laughs> got you, guys. So just minor upgrade. Okay, all right. It, at least it's good to know that you know they're they're still evolving with it. And yeah, hate to see Kelpie God go. If anyone's seen uh, Game Nights, they know there's a whole inside joke of Kelpie God or whatever not. But yeah, neither here nor there. The inner casual player just peeked out. Um, any other notable categories you want to talk about outside the untappers? Um, I got some utility spells down there. Okay. Um, we've talked about three out of the five. The only ones are Born Upon a Wind and Phantasmal Image that we haven't talked about. Okay. Um, Born Upon a Wind, you know, part of part of our part of our instant speed win conditions. Just a good card in general. Um, Phantasmal Image. Uh, I've gone back and forth between whether this should be a Phyrexian Metamorph, Phantasmal Image, Flesh Duplicate, you know, any one of those. Um, mostly a meta choice. If if your local meta's on a lot of the One Rings, like if every deck is playing the One Ring, I'd probably go with Phyrexian Metamorph. Gotcha. Um, 
most of my local metal isn't playing that card nearly as much as a lot of other people are so i'm on phantasmal image gotcha 100 uh, yeah it's okay. just a just a utility choice that's about okay. it i think i think that's all of our our categories here okay that sounds good well before we let everybody go We've gone over a lot of information, but we gotta see how everything comes together. So I'm gonna run you a couple play test hands and mm -hmm. I wanna see, we're gonna say keep or go, I'll give you a scenario and then we'll just say keep or mole and we'll just keep it there. So you ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so let's say in this first hand before I deal uh, another hand, I, let's say you're going first, it's your lucky day. It's you, mm -hmm. Tim the Crom is going second, Time is going third and in fourth is good old uh, Marnius Calgar. So <laughs> let's uh, let's deal us a hand. First hand is a windswept heath, a mystic remora, a phantasmal image, an intuition, a wild growth, a spell, uh, a seeker of skybreak, and a finale of devastation. Uh, you said it was me, T and K, Marnia, or who was third? Uh, Tyam, the stack set. Yeah, okay. Um, if. It seems like Mystic Remora is probably going to draw you a decent number of cards. It's a little risky, of course, keeping it solely on the back of Mystic Remora. Yeah. Um, assuming you draw any second land um, to put the wild growth onto, yeah. it probably gets there with a, a good, a decent uh, chance. You, the one thing is definitely missing is actual interactive spells. Yeah. Um, for the early wins. But against T and K, Tam and Marnius, nobody's really going for for super fast wins. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think that's a pod full of stat. The fastest deck in uh, deck in that pod is definitely T and K, and mm -hmm. unless they got an, an opening hand ad nauseum, they're just probably going to just set up an early draw engine. So yeah, mm -hmm. and even I can uh I could if I could add on to that, it looks like honestly, if you don't draw your land for the first, you could always start off wild growth starting off and set up for a turn two mystic remora in that universe where it's just like okay go turn two mystic remora and then uh yes it's a little sore but you keep the fish around around longer and wait for people to just slowly feed you and whatever not because turn two fishes are a lot less scary than turn one fishes and it's a lot, lot more likely to stick around and do the job it needs to do Stone Another thing you can kind of do is uh, if your Mystic Remora doesn't get there and you can you can then just wild growth uh, your land and cast a Fimage and copy their uh, TNK's Krom. Very uh, true, very get, true. That'll get you get you a little bit of something going on or a Esper Sentinel from, from any of them or something like that. No, that's a very good catch, yeah. In such a grindy pot, something's Somebody's coming out that allows you to get the card advantage going, yeah. And then, okay. All right, I like that. All right, uh, and with the game plan, is the game plan to try to draw cards into a way to cast our commander, or what, what direction are we heading with this since we have a draw engine in the opener? We have a draw engine in the opener. Um, with a Seeker of Skybreak, you're probably just hitting on the on the Mr. Grimora. Um, like I said, Seeker of Skybreak doesn't actually untap your, your land, so it's not technically a mana dork in this situation. Mm -hmm. Um... You know, it, it, it mostly relies on just sitting on the Mr. Kimura for a little while okay. uh, and, and seeing what you draw and kind of going from there. You're not really on a fast Alondo activation hand. You're more probably on the Hermit Druid right. kind of heart, kind of hand. Yeah, we do see this situation, or, or yeah. Even in this case, if you do end up drawing like a Mana Crypt and, and a bunch of mana finaleing for an Unctus, mm. the, the Secret Fabric Unctus combo. Got you. Okay. So it mostly just depends on how much mana you end up drawing at that hand. Okay. That sounds good. If we draw a first card for turn, we do see a shrieking drake. So unfortunately it isn't uh it's not a land for turn, but that fish we're hoping the fish to get us in the game, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's say for this second pot then. Unfortunately, we're not going fourth, but we're going third. We have a rock side going first. Second, we have a Dahada and we are going third and fourth is good old uh, let let's say it's heliod uh the sun crown the mono white stacks deck let's see our first seven okay mm -hmm. all right we have a misty rainforest a malevolent a, mane, a, a malevolent hermit a spell snare a force of will a noxious revival court of calling and force of vigor 
Uh, you probably won't look at this game. Yeah. Ah, it, man. It, it's it. really tough because, like, we're going third, two, two turbo decks going first and second. We got hella interaction. But I, I can hear you. I can hear that. It's only one it, land. Well, no, the Noxious is two, force. makes it two lands. But, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, so we have both forces. We don't, like, it, it stops an Underworld Breach from both of them. We have Force of Will for, for an early Adnaz, but like it doesn't really do anything for us. That's fair. And we only have one land, so like yeah. if we don't get there, we, we're really just just <laughs> kind of handing Heliod the game, I guess. I don't know. Right, right, right. I mean, well, the good thing is if it's a mono white, if it's the mono white Heliod, we're good. If it's the white and blue Heliod, we gotta we gotta try something else. But we are going against the mono white Heliod. But let's go check a second seven. Okay, it is a City of Brass Command Tower, male male a Malevolent Hermit once again, a Born Upon the Wind, an Unctus, a Grand, uh, an Unctus, a Wild Growth, and a Mobilize. This is fine. Turn okay. One wild Growth, turn two, Hermit, and leave up the activation. Uh, turn three, probably a Londo, depending on if whether or not you draw a fourth mana source. Um, kind of going from there, you've got to mobilize to to exile to Orlando and, and can trip it away. Okay, you're you're probably fine with this. It's it's probably it, I probably wouldn't keep it first seven. If, if this was a six, I'd definitely keep it and bottom the board upon a wind. Fair, yeah, I hear that. I hear that. Okay, yeah, As I a definitely first seven. I might be greedy and shift this. You want to try? Let's let's just see. Let's so let's say you, you kept it, or what? Just you want to try a six real quick? How you feeling about this? Be honest. I think first seven, I would mull it in this. We are in a second, though. I hear you. There. Or, is, if, if if this is first seven, I think malevolent hermit might be good enough at at you know kind of rattlesnaking Dahada and Rogsai enough. Yeah, yeah. That it might be fine. Yeah. No, I definitely hear you there because everyone's going to be like, first of all, they're going to want to make you to pop it. But even more than that, it's like a thing of like, it's known on board. I'm going to be able to counter one of your non-creature spells. So don't get a little mm -hmm. too froggy. So, And it's mm -hmm. an ability as well, so you can't counter it. Okay. Just for fun. Look, go ahead, brother. I was going to say, we also have Heliod to kind of, we're, I assume most of those Heliod lists are on rule of laws. True. Um, and, you know, keeping up a Malevolent Hermit to kind of Rattlesnake until Heliod can... Uh, you know, shut them out with a rule of all kind of stuff. Yeah, I hear you there. Hear you. This this hand mostly buys Heliod time to help us, if that makes sense. Got you, 100%. That makes sense. Okay. So we're just hoping to make sure we get to turn two. As long as we can get to turn two, we're golden. If they went on turn, or if they went on their turn two before our, our twin, we're fucked. But that's just the penalty of going third. We can't do nothing about that. And if we look at our draw, Okay, we got another land return. It's not—it's not the funnest thing in the world. It's a bark channel pathway, but it's, yeah, we we still got some action to put down. But with that said, brother, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much for this in-depth hermit druid list of Alondo, man. Like, I love to see everything you've talked about. You've gone so in depth. Like, I'm not gonna lie. Like, this is a deck that if you love a deck that really has the potential just to like um reward you for really just learning your deck well this is the deck for you so but i want to ask you we got a lot of good simic decks out there we got the booger man kenan out there why should our pilots our cdh pilots run alondo over a brew like kenan uh kenan is the boogeyman that means you're gonna get a lot more attention on yourself for sure mm. um People are going to kill Kinnon over and over again. People are going to attack your resources a lot harder than they will, yeah. uh, you know, uh, Alondo. Uh, yeah. win winning at instant speed is not really something most Kinnon decks nowadays are trying to be doing. Uh, right. They Some of them can, for sure, or at least lock your opponents out from winning, um, depending on the version they're playing. Right. But this one wins at instant speed, and, and mm -hmm. I think that's really powerful in this meta. I hear that. I agree. Okay, cool. Well, with that said, I want to say thank you so much, Martian. I look forward to the gameplay. We're going to have my boys, D-Mage and Fidel in, this, in that bitch as well. So we're about to have a really, really great gameplay. But with that said, thank you all so much for this, for being here with this Deck Tech. If you're for looking for more ways to support the show, bro, we have a plethora of ways starting out with our TC merch, our Thunder Conductor merch, everything from our white outline to 
our beautiful black outline or just the TC classic design. If you're also saying, hey, Thunder Conductor, I ain't really looking for no like clothes, but I'm trying to get more decks. Don't worry, I got you too. We got the Thunder Conductor proxies, my way to increase access to this amazing format we call CEDH. And you're like, hey, Thunder, how do I get to know you more? How do I get part of the community? Check us out, Discord. Open Discord, get some jams, some games, and ask me some questions, get to know the community. But in addition, if you're looking for deeper access to be able to do everything like get shout outs on the streams, exclusive question and answers and uh, get your deck requests done join the patreon it's as little as five dollars you get to just get all those benefits and more actually big shout out to scott mitchell part of our mono red tier patron and lastly if you say hey thunder i love all the benefits but i just want to say one time for the fun time i love what you do i love what you're about i want to bless you no worries going to buy me a coffee it keeps me up and keeps the lights on but with that said i love y'all y'all be great and i'll see y'all soon in this Alando Hermit Druid gameplay. Peace.